seemed to be a marked reluctance from the Royal Mail uh, and the consultants that were employed on the project to consider any alteration of the project because it weren't really... I worked on the project as a uh, public affairs consultant between 2012 and 2013, when we come point to go public affairs. Uh, so our, our role was to act as a go-between between the applicants, the Royal Mail and their various consultants and the local community and the two local authorities coming in. The, the applicants were not uh, expecting or anticipating approval of the plans by either Camden or Islington Council. Indeed, they were turned down by both councils. They were really you know, impatient to get on with it and actually deal with the Mayor of London, who, as we now know, has, um, has approved the plan. So the work that I was involved in, which was communicating with the two councils and uh, you know, organising you know, exhibitions to consult the local community were, with hindsight, just window dressing. Really. The Royal Mail plan um, was based on delivering a certain degree of profit for the Royal Mail and um, their commercial partners, and I can quite understand that any development has to has to make a profit. But there was a credibility gap between the amount of affordable housing that. Royal Mail said they could afford and the amount of affordable housing that the councils require and that the local community needs. Of course there's also a problem with, with the timing, that just as the consultation was underway and uh, Royal Mail was saying they couldn't afford any more affordable housing, Royal Mail of course was being privatised and uh, there were lots of reports in the media which um, you know, alleged that it had been undervalued by at least £1 billion and the shares of media rose in value after valuation. So it's very difficult to persuade um, very difficult to persuade Labour politicians in either Camden or Islington that this is a company that couldn't afford to provide more, more affordable housing on the site given the fact that it had been um, apparently privatised on the cheap by, um, by the government. So in actual fact when we actually tried to arrange meetings with local politicians in many cases they refused to meet me with us and as someone who used to be a councillor myself in Greenwich until recently I can quite understand why. Yeah, you know, the official line was that the developments of Mount Pleasant had been you know, uh, 20 or more years in the planning and it had absolutely nothing to do with privatisation but in reality it had everything to do with it really. And the main problem was that they were proposing very large blocks of flats up to 15 storeys high which didn't really relate very well to the local streetscape and uh, as we can see there are some large office buildings you know, you know, near the site. Most of the buildings around the site and the immediate vicinity of the site are you know, Victorian or Georgian buildings that are only two, three or four storeys high. So it was essentially rather, uh, you know, rather alien. They were citing the Holiday Inn Hotel on Farringdon Road as a benchmark for height across the site and they argue that most of the buildings would be no higher than the Holiday Inn. But the Holiday Inn is, is notorious locally as one of the most incongruous and ugly buildings in the area. So that really didn't get the public consultation off to a good start. You know, four architects involved, all very well respected in their field, but there seemed to be a marked reluctance from the Royal Mail uh, and the consultants that were employed on the project to consider any alterations to the project because they weren't really particularly interested, I gradually learned, in what Camden or Islington had to say. They were really interested in getting approval and they recognised early on that was unlikely to come from either Camden or Islington and it would have to come due course from the Mayor of yeah, Among the residents, among the immediate neighbours of the site are some pretty high power people, including Thomas Heatherwick, who's a sort of A-list designer who designed both the um, Olympic Cauldron and the Routemaster bus. And, uh, that was, uh, he became quite an implacable opponent of the plans and I think the architects and the planners could have anticipated that at an early stage, that among the, um, among the opponents of the scheme were some pretty high powered people who know about architecture, know about planning and know about the media and the Guardian spaces down the road and they should really have um, made the plans a bit more, a bit more bulletproof or critic proof before they went out to, um, before they went out of consultation. It's always difficult with schemes like this where alternative sites are suggested um, by someone who's not the owner of the site, as has happened in this case. And it really needs the intervention of someone in a position of great authority, such as the Mayor of London, to make things happen. But far from making it happen, the, uh, 
the Mayor of London has approved the plans of the Royal Mail with only some very minimal uh, alterations. So, um, barring any uh, regime change um, in City Hall in the next few months, which is not, you know, doesn't seem likely, um, I think Great Streets may struggle to get their alternative plan up the uh, off the ground. I wish them well.